going to be talking about trails. And I am going, I just want to remind everybody that we are streaming live to YouTube. So if you would like to turn off your camera, please do. Everybody will be muted and you will be able to ask questions in the chat. And I will share those with our three uh, representatives today. But first, I'm going to do a quick presentation, a little bit of an introduction, and then we're going to get started with the fun stuff. So my name is Helen Dulac. I work for the Office of Environmental Quality and Sustainability, and I am super excited to be working with the Dallas Public Library on this Earth Day Everyday series. It's Thursdays at noon. And I just want to give you a brief introduction of our department. Uh, we started in 2004, and back then we were called the Office of Environmental Quality. We worked really hard for four years to help Dallas become the first city in the United States to achieve in a special environmental certification called ISO 14001. What we did is we looked at our operations across 14 different departments in the city to see how we could still provide service with less of an impact on the environment. So we made all of these different changes to our fleet all the way to the paper we put in our copy machines. And we get audited every year to keep the certification. And another remarkable thing about this is this is Dallas, Texas that achieved this certification. It wasn't a city in California. It wasn't a city in Colorado. It wasn't Austin, it was Dallas. So we have a history of green and we're just going greener. So let's fast forward 10 years where a lot of changes happened. Uh, there was a restructuring in the city and uh, OEQ absorbed uh, some other environmental operations and programs and we doubled in size. And to reflect this change, we changed our name. That's when we became Dallas Office of Environmental Quality and Sustainability, also known as DEQS. So also that year, uh, we created a combined outreach and engagement team with that merger that I'm a proud member of. And then the following year, Mayor Johnson created a uh, committee, a council committee for the environment and sustainability. They meet the first Monday of every month. Those are uh, meetings are open to the public virtually. And it's a great way to find out what the city is doing environmentally. Uh, if you have heard of my department, it's probably because in 2020, uh, this year, 2020, May, on May 27th, the city adopted its first environmental and climate action plan called CCAP. It is our roadmap for the next 30 years on how Dallas is going to improve the environment and mitigate climate change. Uh, we are one of the few Texas cities that has a formally adopted climate plan, and we're also one of the few inland cities that has this. So once again, Dallas is green and just going greener. You can view all 250 pages of the CCAP at dallasclimateaction.com and also programs like this actually align with the CCAP. There actually is a part in the CCAP about our open and green spaces. So I mentioned that this uh, group went through a merger back in 2018. Those groups you see in green are what joined us. And I'm gonna talk about one of those just briefly and that is stormwater. So stormwater is anytime water leaves your property. So it can be from the rain, it could be from your sprinkler systems, it could be from a hose. So that water goes down your lawn, maybe down your driveway into the street, travels all the way down those gutters into that big drain at the end of the street. Well, that drain is called a storm drain inlet and it's there for one primary reason and that's to remove the water so that streets don't flood. Now we have about 70,000 of those in the city and they work really well. They remove that water so quickly that it's not cleaned and it's not treated. And it goes directly into a creek or a stream and then it connects to one of our lakes or to the Trinity River. So if it picks up any pollution along the way like litter, uh, some leaky uh, automotive fluids from your driveway, if it picks up bacteria from pet waste because uh, you forgot to pick up after your pet, that's how those pollutants get into our waters. So just remember pollution at home doesn't always stay at home and be mindful about what you do outside. I mentioned the outreach and engagement team that I'm on. Well, we want to empower Dallas to save the earth. And we do that by virtual presentations like this and in person when we're allowed. Uh, if, you're in the, if you're in Dallas, we can present for free for you. Uh, to set example, HOA meetings, different clubs and organizations. We also have a lot of material for students anywhere from K to college. And we also do activities and events. If you invite us to speak, what do we talk about? Well, we talk about environmental topics from A to Z, all the way from air quality to zero waste. Also, we host some of our own events. And just on Saturday, we had the 26th WaterWise Landscape Tour. Uh, and you can actually go on the virtual tour and visit local WaterWise landscapes at savedallaswater.com. And you can actually see several landscapes where people have completely removed their grass. So you can see a zero turf home and there's multiple ones of those around Dallas. And you can imagine they save a lot of water. 
So with that, if you ever have any questions, just go to greendallas.net to find more information and green tips for, about the city. If you ever have a question for me or any of my coworkers, just drop an email to greendallas at dallascityhall.com. And also please follow us on social media. We are, at, we are at Green Dallas on Twitter and Instagram, and we are Green Dallas TX on Facebook. And just as a special thank you for joining us today, if you do send an email to greendallas at dallascityhall.com, include your name and your mailing address, you will get a free gift. And with that, I am super excited to uh, introduce our friends from the Audubon Center and let's learn about some trails. Awesome, thank you very much. Uh, we're excited to be here. My name is Jake Poinsett at the Trinity River Audubon Center. And with me, my friends, Marcus Cole from the Trinity River Audubon Center and Katie Crispin from the Dogwood Canyon Audubon Center. Um, so thank you to the folks in the city of Dallas and Dallas Public Library for inviting us to talk about um, Earth Day every day. And extremely fitting, we're gonna talk about exploring nature in the Dallas area. So I'm gonna share my screen for a presentation we put together. Everyone can see that, right? Awesome. So explore the outdoors in Dallas. I know that sounds crazy to some people. Like, what do you mean, nature in Dallas? Like, but believe it or not, there's tons of green spaces. Like Helen was saying before, we are a very green city. And it's all over. You don't need to travel very far. But two of our favorite green spaces in the DFW area are the Trini River Audubon Center and the Dogwood Canyon Audubon Center. Um, your two local centers in North Texas. And we are part of the National Audubon Society. So let's see here, there we go. Uh, and before we continue to talk about Audubon and what we do and what our society is all about, a couple of reminders to reiterate what Helen was saying. Um, while we are presenting, uh, be best practices to please mute your microphone and keep your camera turned off, your computer sound, on and video on and communicate via the chat. So afterwards we can have some time to kind of, you know, have a conversation, talk about some of the things that, uh, you know, we talked about today. If you have any questions, we'd be very happy to, to answer. So, that, you know, the name Audubon is, you know, synonymous with birds because we are a bird conservation organization. And we've been around for a very, very long time and we're all over the country and we're all over the world. And since 1823, John James Audubon uh, was a really, really important force in bird conservation due to his illustrations and his work in learning about birds in North America. And that's why he, his name is our namesake. And the first Audubon Society was founded in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, a group of people got together um, because they were in love with birds. And a very popular tradition were the Christmas bird hunts, uh, where people would go out and shoot as many birds as they could. Um, but instead, it turned into a bird count, was the alternative. And we still do that every year. In fact, ours is coming up. Dogwood area is hosting one. The Trinity River Audubon Center area is hosting one. Um, so it's a very, really important citizen science project where people learn about the health of birds. And it's one of our traditions here in Audubon. Um, so a lot of great things have been happening since the 1900s. And we are still a really important organization that is here to preserve the habitat for birds and the places they need for today and tomorrow. And as you can see, our presence is all, over. All, all those little dots we have there are our Audubon chapters, the chapter coverage, our state offices, our sanctuaries and our nature centers. We work uh, to make sure that everyone is reached as much as possible through science-based advocacy, conservation and education. And that's what we do at our Audubon centers. We are uh, the boots on the ground, your, your local Audubon area. Um, if you look in North Texas here, you have those dots, those blue dots, and then right under it, the two green dots, those are our nature centers in here, the Trinity Audubon Center and the Dogwood Canyon Audubon Center. And to make sure that we are doing our job, we have our strategic priorities. And there's a variety of them because there's a lot of different issues that we need to tackle when we're talking about birds and habitat conservation. Uh, one specifically is coasts. The Gulf of Mexico is very important for birds. Millions of birds migrate through there every year, um, right here in the Central Migration Flyway. Places like High Island is great for birding, for birders, recreational activities, um, important stopover habitats. 
Um, and also it's important for um, just the health of our environment now that we live here too. Another one is working lands. You know, Texas is a grassland state. A lot of that habitat has been converted to monocultural crop farms. And in turn, the birds that rely on it don't have the habitat they need. So we've been working together with private landowners to make sure that these grasslands are still available for these grassland dependent species. And also water, we're talking about with Helen, uh, the importance of the Trinity River and the water supply it gives to all these people, not, in our, not just in our city, but downstream from us. So we wanna make sure the water stays clean for us and the birds. Bird communities like the city of Dallas, we are a bird city, woo! Which is something to be very proud of, as well as climate. We need to make sure that these places are around for not just today, but for tomorrow down the future, down the road. And you can see here a nice little illustration of the flyways and the different birds that go through each flyway, all the different species. Uh, North America is very important for birds, um, and specifically in Texas, 650 species have been reported. So this is a really birdy place. Um, and when you're out exploring and hiking, you're probably gonna see a lot of birds, including Audubon centers and places nearby. So now we know a little bit about Audubon, what we do, what we're all about. What are the couple tips when you're planning your trip to go and explore your favorite uh, natural places and spaces? We're gonna hand it over to Katie. Hey everybody, so um, the big thing we're talking about today is um, how do I go about hiking? Where do I go and um, how do I choose a trail and decide what to do? So I'm gonna go over planning ahead and preparing for doing that. Um, so I'm gonna talk about deciding where to go. Um, you know, how do I choose based on my experience level? You know, focusing on um, the seasons and being prepared before you go out and um, decide to do some hiking. Next slide, please. So choosing where you go is probably one of the most important things because there are a lot of options out here um, in the DFW Metroplex um, to be able to choose a trail. So a couple of things you wanna look at um, when you're looking at going out, um, whether you're going by yourself or a group of friends or your family. One of the things you wanna look at is what is your experience level? Are you someone that um, is a beginner? Like you've never done any hiking or have you been hiking your entire life? Um, so that'll be one of the first things to look at when you're looking at a trail. A lot of trails will give you um, the type of route, the difficulty level, how long it is, elevation changes. You wanna look at all those things. I'm not gonna send you, as someone who's an experienced hiker, I'm not gonna send you on a trail that's 20 miles if you're a, a beginner. Um, that's just not something that's really safe. Um, another question to ask yourself is what is your fitness level? I've seen some people who are like, hey, I wanna get in shape, so I'm gonna go on the hardest trail as possible. Don't do that because you're gonna get yourself into trouble. Um, so start off slow, you know, start off on a trail that's maybe one to two miles and then work your way up. Um, especially when you're getting into some of the warmer seasons, um, you don't wanna overdo it and have a negative experience and then not wanna go hiking again. Um, consider the length of the trail and the amount of time you have, okay? Uh, so for most people, you know, you think on average, if you're just doing a regular walking pace, most people can walk, you know, about uh, a 5K, which is like three miles or so, maybe about 45 minutes to do that on an average walking pace. But think about that. If you're choosing a trail that's about five miles, how much time do you have? Um, if you're starting to walk as the sun is setting, um, and you only have 30 minutes, you know, that all goes into the amount of time for the trail that you have. Taking consideration the weather. So this is really important. We see this a lot at our centers um, where sometimes people will decide to go hiking in the afternoon in the middle of the summer and it's 100 degrees out. We do not recommend doing that. Um, it's not a safe thing. Um, and so if it's going to be warmer and you want to go out hiking in the summer, plan your hike earlier in the morning um, when it's a little bit cooler. Um, this is actually the perfect weather to be hiking. Um, it's 70 out. It's cool. You know, the sun comes out. It warms up. You can layer really nicely. I love this weather. Um, you can hike in the wintertime. I, I see a lot of there are some people that don't like to hike when it's cooler. I love it. 
Um, I think Jake and Marcus do too. <laughs> so um, I think it's great. But take that into consideration when you decide to go hiking because that's how you plan your trip. And you also want to consider other things when you're looking at a place to go, like do you, are there fees to get into the place um, that you want to go? You don't want to drive and then find out, oh shoot, like I have to make a reservation or I have to pay uh, to get in. If you're taking a dog, check before you go because you don't want to find out you can't bring your dog into the location you're going into. Um, what are the operating hours? With COVID going on right now, a lot of places have had to make adjustments due to staffing and other restrictions. So it's always good to call first before you go into an area. The state parks nowadays are restricting how many people can go. So you have to make a reservation beforehand and they do charge. Um, so it's really important to make sure you know those things before you go. Here at our Audubon centers, we are doing reservation only on Fridays and Saturdays. And so that's really important. Other places, like we don't charge a fee, we rely on donations. You know, um, so keep those things in mind because we don't want to see people get upset when they show up and they're like, oh, shoot, I can't walk now. I can't hike now. Um, so know before you go. Do your research before you go when you're going out there. And then look at what activities might you be able to do. Anytime I go hiking or go to some place, sometimes I want to see, hey, can I do like camping there? Can I kayak there? Can I bird watch there? Because maybe there's something else. Um, I want to do, or maybe I have to have a change of plans because something else couldn't happen. So I always want to have a backup plan. Next slide, please. Okay, so being prepared. So this is really important. Um, again, I've seen a lot of people, they'll be like, hey, I'm only going out for one or two hours. I don't need to pack anything. And then they run into some trouble. You just never know what's going to happen when you're out on the trail. So even if you're going for a day trip, you know, at least make sure you have some bare minimum things. And you might have heard about the 10 essentials or just having some essentials in your pack. So make sure one, you have hydration. This is so important. Even if as it's getting colder, sometimes um, we think, well, it's cool out. I don't need to hydrate. That's a lie. Make sure you're hydrating. Have some food like a granola bar, you know, some fruit, something to sustain you. Um, make sure you have a way to navigate if you are to get lost and make sure you know how to use it too. Um, a lot of us rely solely on our phones, but I can tell you um, from experience that I have been in some areas within Texas. I actually went down to Kikopo State Park, um, which is in Brackenville, Texas, and I did not have cell reception the majority of the time I was down there. So I had to have a backup plan for many of the places I was hiking and I was visiting. You wanna have light. There have been times where I have ended up hiking longer than normal and have gotten back later after the sun has set. So that is an important thing to have. Some type of shelter. Um, I'm not saying you have to put a um, tent in your backpack, but something, if you were to be stuck overnight, um, what would you do in that um, experience? Have a first aid kit available, um, and then some type of uh, ability to start a fire. And these are the essentials. You can pack it any way you want, but the way to think of this is if I'm going on a day hike and I got stuck overnight, would I be able to survive that and survive it well? Next slide, please. Oh, and this is one of my favorite slides is enjoy the wildlife from a distance, okay? <laughs> so the cool thing about being in the DFW Metroplex is we have so much diversity here. There's so much diversity of wildlife here in Texas. About 80% of Texans live in an urban area and we're starting to see that expand more and more and more. And one of my favorite phrases, a friend has always told me, has said, if you care, leave it there. Okay, so if you care about the wildlife you're seeing, leave it there, unless it absolutely needs assistance or something like that. Um, so it's really important if we see something, no matter how cute or adorable it looks, don't sit there and try to pick it up or try to touch it or anything like that. Um, you know, we are seeing more instances where people are seeing more wildlife when they're out and about. Um, even here at our centers, we're seeing, you know, bobcats, coyotes, uh, different types of birds, 
you know, all those different things. Sometimes when I open the dumpster, there's raccoons in there. Uh, <laughs> they're just trying to get, you know, a little extra snack and everything like that. Um, but, you know, the best thing we can do is just keep our distance from the animals that we're seeing. One of the best things you can do as well is whatever you pack in, make sure you pack out. That's a really important leave no trace principle. Um, you can see the, the squirrel in the picture was chowing down on some, some garbage. The raccoons really love hot Cheetos and things like that, you know, so we don't want to encourage them to be eating the things that we have left behind. And it's no fun for anybody else that's hiking to see any garbage that's left behind either. So show that respect for them. Um, you know, if you want to take a picture, take a picture from a distance. But those interactions, if we can limit those as much as possible. And next slide, please. And I'll leave this to Marcus. Okay, thank you, Katie, for that great information. <clears throat> and, and to uh, piggyback off of the, if you care, leave it there, how about the leave no trace principles? Um, a lot of good information here. And I'm just gonna go through an overview because Katie's done a really good job of hitting on these topics. So if you spend much time in the great outdoors, you're likely to hear the phrase, leave no trace. And simply put, it's the best practices we should follow to enjoy and protect natural spaces. With well over 100 million visitors uh, to outings located in the United States each year, our love for the outdoors can take its toll. Uh, Texas is not only home to great music, great food and culture, but it's one of the biggest tourism generators in the country. In other words, people love the natural ecoregions sprinkled throughout Texas and the unique flora and fauna that comes with it. Uh, unfortunately, these impacted areas suffer from litter because let's face it, humans have a long track record of leaving a mess wherever they go. Uh, we have to consider unintentional spread of invasive species. You know, there are some beautiful plants and flowers in other countries. And although these foreign floras would look great against the Texas sunset, uh, invasive species outcompete our beautiful native species. And that can cause a domino effect of problems. Uh, let's think about trail erosion, uh, pollution to water sources. All of these things have less of a foothold if we were to exercise the leave no trace principles uh, for every outing. Now, while most of us don't intend to harm our natural surroundings, we may lack the knowledge to preserve it, or we simply overlook those few important behaviors, uh, those red flags, those indicators that let us know there's a downturn to the health of an ecoregion as a whole. So uh, to reiterate, leave no traces, plan ahead and prepare, travel and camp on durable surfaces, dispose of waste properly, uh, leave what you find, minimize campfire impacts, respect wildlife and be considerate. Next slide, please. One, so great examples of how we can enjoy the outdoors safely and respectfully, thank you. Now let's go over uh, some of our favorite outdoor places in the DFW area, our two North Texas centers, Dogwood Canyon Audubon Center and the Tr Trinity River Audubon Center. Um, bonus question, if you know it, place it in the chat. What is the third center in Texas? It's located in San Antonio. We have Dogwood Canyon, Cedar Hill, Trinity River uh, uh, in Dallas. If you know, put it in the chat and uh, we'll get to it later, awesome. Let's see here. All right, so let's talk about the Trinity River Audubon Center first. Now, what's track all about? We are 10 minutes from downtown Dallas, but it feels a world away. That's what we like to say, because uh, we are within the 6,000 acre Great Trinity Forest, which is the nation's largest urban bottomland hardwood forest, which is a mouthful, but it's a really significant track of, of property, of, of you know, natural significance. It's really important for wildlife. This habitat hosts countless species of mammals, reptiles, amphibians, birds. Um, around 250 species have been documented on our property within the Great Trinity Forest, and I'm sure there's much more. So some migrate through because we are in the Central Migration Flyway and they use the Trinity River kind of like this 
natural corridor to travel through. Some are found year round, some just during the summer, some just during the winter. So when you're exploring these five miles of trail, which you can see on this picture of our map here, all the trails connect in one way or another through different habitat types, woodlands, prairie, wetlands, you can find a diversity of birds and other wildlife. And when you're not just hiking on your own, exploring on your own pace, we offer educational programs uh, when we are open, which right now is Fridays and Saturdays from eight to one, and you can register online ahead of time. Um, and you can look and see when our next guided hike will be, which I believe is this Saturday. That's our next one, right, Marcus? I think so. And then third Saturday of the month is our guided bird walk. So whatever you're interested in, come join us um, or come out with your volunteer group and help participate in some of our habitat restoration or trail maintenance. So a lot of things that are happening at TRAC. That's our acronym, by the way, for the Trinity River Audubon Center. I'm gonna hand this over to Marcus. All right, great. Thank you, Jake. Uh, the Great Trinity Forest. So we, there's a lot of information to cover here, so we're gonna dive right into it. Uh, the bottomland hardwood forests are seasonally flooded forests located along waterways. These unique forests contain many plant species, structurally complex vegetation, just a great deal of cover and deep leaf litter. <clears throat> Together, these factors make the bottomland forest habitat uh, uh, accessible for more species of wildlife than most other forest types. The alternating wet and dry periods make a single forest uh, suitable for different wildlife species during each season of the year. So here at the Trinity River Audubon Center, our forest trail splits up into two. Uh, first, we'll talk about the primitive forest trail. It's 0.32 miles. It has the natural trail, which is soil rather than the granite gravel. And that's gonna be unimproved natural trails. These surfaces are unpaved and they have the indigenous soil, leaf litter, pine straws, mowed grass or wood chips uh, sometimes. The soil bottomland forest is richer in nutrients and, and the soils of most other forest types um, in, in the bottomland forest uh, don't produce as much uh, leaf litter. And that's because we have a domination by different tree species. Now the primitive trail is dominated by the Southern red cedars. A unique adaptation utilized by these cedars is the dropping of the pine needles, uh, which lowers the pH of the soil and pushes out any other competitors that can't withstand that acidic soil. Although these trees uh, could look dead from the bottom part, they actually maintain most of their leaves, their needles uh, at the top of the trees to perform photosynthesis. Uh, in order for a forest to grow, you need biodiversity and that's kind of uh, what we want in a forest. You want many different plants, trees, animals working together because that shows health. That's where the forest is growing. You get one dominant species taken over and they're gonna take all the resources and that part of the forest can't grow. Now meanders through the bottomland hardwood forest. Uh, this serves as a critical role in the watershed by reducing the risk uh, and severity of flooding to downstream communities by providing areas um, of flood water. And in addition, the wetlands improve water quality by filtering the water before it reaches open water. Mixed hardwood and conifer species, I've talked about those red cedars. And we also have to identify deciduous trees. So deciduous trees are gonna be the trees that uh, we all know and love. They drop their leaves during a part in, uh, certain part of the, the year in certain seasons. And that's where we get a lot of those mixed uh, leaf litter from. Each has the ability to, to survive in areas that are seasonally flood or covered with water much of the year. Uh, deciduous trees and these uh, conifers come work together in order to help the forest grow. With the deciduous trees, you have your oak trees, your walnuts and pecan trees. Um, and the conifers are gonna be those predominantly evergreen. And for the most part, they don't lose their leaves during specific seasons. Uh, conifers could include junipers, cedars and pines. Now woodpeckers and raptors galore, uh, because of the mixed trees of the bottom hardwood forest, uh, your deciduous and your conifers, it's gonna promote nestings, uh, sites and give you food option. Here in the primitive forest, we have those cedars and uh, there are gonna be certain woodpeckers 
that are going to take advantage of that because they can get uh, a nice home in there. Um, and you can see them come during the winter. We might get those migratory woodpeckers like the northern flickers, yellow bellied sapsuckers. And the northern flickers, uh, they're pretty cool because they often uh, are found on open edges of the bottomland hardwood forest and mostly, mostly feed on the ground rather than in trees. Um, now, moving on to the forest trail, it's about uh, 0.38 miles, mostly granite gravel. So it's that improved gravel, compacted limestone, soil stabilizer, crushed shell. Uh, the type of surfaces used uh, in this location uh, are going to be expected for large foot traffic. Now, cuts through the bottomland hardwood forest as well as pocket prairies. Um, so here we want to think about ecological success, succession, which takes place uh, where ecosystems are going to go through a series of changes and, and develop into mature forests. And that change is where we see those pocket prairies. So these little pockets of prairie that are next to uh, the mature growth of a forest. This is where some of our trails, the forest trails, uh, are going to go through cut through. Uh, beware poison ivy. So there's that famous saying, three leaves, let it be, um, or hairy vine, scary vine. So poison ivy is, uh, it has oil on the leaf. As humans, we touch it and we have a reaction to those leaves. We get this nasty rash. Some people have a really high reaction to it. Some have a mild or low reaction, but it's important for birds because it does provide berries during the winter season. And some animals depend on those berries uh, when food is scarce. And as far as that uh, uh, rash that humans get, it's gonna mainly affect humans. For example, if a dog were to touch the oil, it's not gonna get a rash. Um, that oil will just stick on its fur. But if a human were to pet that dog and get the oil on its hands, get the oil on, on your skin, you can get a rash that way. Uh, within the forest trail, we're gonna also get great bird diversity. You know, many birds use the bottomland hardwood forest. Um, Year-round home residents for birds, uh, they support neotropical migrants uh, because large rivers are used to uh, used as navigational aids by migratory birds. The bottomland hardwood forest is located next to a river and it provides this critical habitat for long distance travelers. In fact, some bird species that breed in these forests breed nowhere else in the world. Uh, some of the birds commonly, that commonly use the bottomland hardwood forest include ducks, hairy woodpeckers, red-headed woodpeckers, screech owl, great horned owl, bald eagles, broad-winged hawks, Mississippi kites, wood thrush, blue jays, cardinals, grackles, and the list goes on. Uh, and, and uh, you know, that even includes waterfowl. <clears throat> um, deer, coyote, bobcat, feral hogs. So there is a right, right, wide variety of oaks found in the bottomland hardwood forest, and they produce this important food source that many birds and mammals uh, depend on. So these, uh, these uh, fruiting trees uh, found in the bottomland uh, hardwood forest also provide pathways for wild animals to move from one patch of habitat to another. This dense vegetation allows for them to move in cover so that they can hide from predators. Um, some of the mammals that occur in the bottomland is gonna be the white-tailed deer, the bobcats, the wild hog, raccoons, skunks, fox, beavers, otter, opossum, gray squirrels, bats, and the list goes on. Um, and next slide, please. Excellent. Thank you, Marcus. And uh, like you mentioned before, that there are some, you know, unique wetlands found within that great train forest, the bottomland hardwood forest, or these, these wooded wetlands. Um, seasonal, sometimes you know, they'll have large amounts of water that are held there, and animals have adapted, like amphibians, like the uh, narrow mouth toad that you might hear in the summertime after rain. It kind of sounds like a bunch of goats in the forest, but you know, that's a, that's a toad. Um, they rely on these seasonal wetlands to lay their eggs. And we have trails where we can go and explore these wetlands and other wetlands too, like these emerging wetlands. This picture here, right outside of our, our building, a uh, boardwalk going right over um, and leading towards these, these prairie pot, there are these uh, uh, 
prairie potholes, these seasonal wetlands within our grasslands. So a variety of wetlands found in a variety of habitats here that host tons of life. And since it is a wetland trail, there's boardwalk sections where you get to go right over the water, you get to get a bird's eye view, uh, pun intended. Um, and there's also some natural sections too, where we, like Marcus said before, it's unimproved, um, it's soil, there's grass, and a little more of a, a natural feel to it, a little more connected to nature when you're walking on those trails. A variety of plant species found here that are really, really important for keeping the water quality clean. Um, it acts like a filter when we do have rainwater come down and it acts like a sponge to soak things up. Um, sedges and rushes and beautiful forbs like hibiscus and iris and just plants putting on a show at different times of year. Um, right now, you can see that some of the, the wetlands are, are basically dry because uh, they're not, they don't hold water year round. But now you can really see as a naturalist all the different uh, prints in the, in the soil and the mud and see what kind of animals are moving through there, um, like our beaver friend. Um, there's a very busy beaver who's taken down some of our black willows along the wetland trail. I mean, that's his job. It's, it's, you know, they eat woody species, they use them to create dams and dens. It's kind of fun to see his activity, whatever, you know, where he is along the wetland trails. And if you're a big birder, like we are, big bird nerds, this time of year, a lot of great wintering species found off this trail. Swamp sparrow around our great blue heron pond. They're a little more common in the, the woody wetlands. Sedgeren and marsh wren and more of these marshy type wetlands, sent, you know, hence the name sedge like the plant, marsh like the type of habitat. And of course the waterfowl and wading birds galore. There's a lot of great things found around these habitats and it's really valuable habitat for us now that we live here too. And they have a very, really important function. And then a personal favorite uh, as, as prairie people, we do have a restored section of Blackland Prairie at the Trinity River Audubon Center. And there's a nice trail that cuts through it. Um, it's actively being restored because it's the namesake of our eco region. It used to be from the Red River, of North Texas, all the way down to San Antonio. But today, less than 1% it remains. And it's very fragmented and, and filled with invasive species. So we're working hard with staff and volunteers to reintroduce the native plants that are found in that plant community. Like, in this picture here, we have some wild rye and some nice forbs like Coreopsis and bee balm. That's an already uh, well-established part of our prairie. But the other areas, we're introducing grasses like switchgrass and big blue stem, little blue stem, yellow Indian grass, the big four of the prairie grasses, the tall grass prairie grasses. So quick little plug, if you wanna come be a part of it, make our trail look even more prairie-like, then please join. Um, but right now, the goldenrod is putting on a show, which is really neat because Throughout October last month, we saw a lot of the monarchs that are migrating through that rely on goldenrod. The tall goldenrod is what they feed on, or one of the many plants they feed on when they're migrating south. Um, and of course, we have the grassland dependent birds that are here year round. Um, in the summertime, there's a lot of dick thistle there, uh, meadowlarks. Right now, the northern harriers are all over the place, just soaring down, looking for their prey. Um, they have their disc shaped face, kind of like, a, like an owl, so they can kind of hear everything move around in the grass. Really, really cool, as long as you're here at the right time, you can see them extremely active. Um, but there's another really cool trail going through this grassland habitat that I'll let Marcus talk about called the Overlook Trail. Yeah, so the wetland uh, transition into the prairie trail will bring you to this great Overlook Trail, which gives you just a great view uh, overlooking our property. I really encourage you to come out and see it when you can. Uh, and just that transition, just depending on the, the time of the year, the season, you get these beautiful flowers and then they guide you up to this uh, overlook trail. Very beautiful. Scenic view of the wetlands and the Meadowlock Prairie. So that Meadowlock Prairie, uh, our prairie management plan of short grasses uh, transition into that tall grasses, we mow periodically to promote native plants found in the Blackland Prairie. And, and this is ideal for meadowlarks. Uh, atop the post oak hill, uh, this ecoregion uh, promotes a variety of plant communities, unique understory plants like orchards and lady tresses, uh, and then the old homestead. So there's a, uh, some irises and lilies and dandelions, daffodils that can be found on the overlook. And this is an indication that there used to be a home there. So there used to be a family that lived there and they wanted to improve on the land. So they planted these different uh, plants. 
and flowers so that they could uh, enjoy that scenic view, this overlook view. Next slide, please. I'm sorry, I didn't realize I was on mute. Um, so our great friends at Dallas Parks and Recreation have some wonderful trails right nearby. Like Katie mentioned before, um, we are at a reservation basis right now. So if we're at capacity or if you forgot to make a reservation and still came to the center, there's some trailheads right outside of our property. So check out the at and Trail, the Trinity Trail, there's preserves as well within this beautiful Great Trinity Forest that you can explore on your own. Hey everyone, so I'm going to talk a little bit about Dogwood Canyon and we're only 25 minutes or so from Trinity River Audubon Center, um, about 30 minutes south of Dallas. And the really neat thing about being in Cedar Hill is we're right on the edge of the hill country, so to say. So we get a little bit of elevation change and our habitat is a little bit different. So you'll get a different experience. If you were to go hike over at Trinity River and in that area, and then you come to Cedar Hill, it is a different experience. And um, the, just the scenery is very different. Um, we have about 206 acres that's set aside for conservation, but also for enjoyment, about three miles worth of trails. Um, and we're also in that really important area um, for birds to be flying through what we call the central flyway. Um, next slide, please. So the, one of the aspects that I love about Cedar Hill is in their city planning, 20% um, of our habitat has to be uh, what they call green space. So we're in this green belt area. Um, and so I'm gonna show you some of the other trails um, that we have alongside our center. The Canyon Floor Trail is um, a really popular trail with people, especially if they have young kids. It's a half a mile round trip. It takes about 20 minutes. It's uh, got crushed gravel and um, we see a lot of different types of wildlife on here. Usually I see a lot of wildlife activity. Um, a lot of coyotes and bobcats use that to pass through. So typically I've actually had coyotes walk through that trail and I've seen them walk right in front of me. And you'll see our demonstration gardens like our native demonstration garden um, when you walk through that area. So it's a favorite trail of mine if I just need a quick walk in and out. Um, okay, next slide. So our longer trail is the West Loop Trail. So a lot of people come for this trail because this one is gonna give you that elevation change. And the really neat thing is when you're walking up, you actually do get a big, big uh, slope for this one. So <laughs> the first quarter mile, you're gonna be huffing and puffing quite a bit because we don't usually have hills in the area. And this is where you'll actually get a hill. You'll reach about 800 feet in elevation um, with this trail. And then you're gonna loop around and you're actually walking on the edge of the canyon. So we literally do have a canyon on our property. It's just harder to see because of the vegetation that we have on site. That canyon was formed um, over a million years ago when Texas was covered by an ocean. When that ocean receded, it formed that canyon. So that's kind of where we get the name from. So it's a very beautiful aspect of our trail. It's about 1.6 miles. And attached to that, we actually just got a grant to add an extension to that. So there's another mile loop that you could take. So you could get a really good walk in. You could hike about three miles um, if you come onto there. Some really cool highlights are seeing like Joe Pool Lake, Cowboy Stadium. There's this old rustic cabin on the trail. Um, and the story behind that goes that the old property owners um, built this cabin up on there as a way to get away from the hustle and bustle of the city. And it's been up there. It is now prime rattlesnake habitat. They like to be in there and everything. <laughs> so um, we see a big rattlesnake that hangs out in there often, which is kind of cool. Next slide, please. Um, so yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, we are part of what we call this green belt 
corridor. And so all of Cedar Hill has set aside areas that are conserved and preserved um, for habitat can't be developed. And so right next to us, there is another preserve. It's a city preserve called Cedar Mountain Preserve. I apologize for the amount of cedar names that we have because there's it can be very confusing. Um, this, this area shares the parking lot with us. The trail starts from our parking lot and um, you'll walk along 1382, then go up in the woods. It's a mile of unpaved trail. It's a very easy loop, but the entire preserve is 110 acres. So it's right in between us and Cedar Hill State Park. And it's just a part of that initiative between Dallas County and the city of Cedar Hill and their open space program. Next slide, please. Okay, so Cedar Ridge Preserve. This is probably the hottest hiking place you can find here in our area. Um, it's technically in Dallas. It's like five miles from our, our center here. It's a 600 acre nature preserve. And um, they have about nine miles worth of trail. So you could find a trail that's a quarter of a mile. You could find, I think the longest one is about 2.8 miles. Um, and you will definitely get some elevation change um, when you're out there, if you want a good workout, this is the place to go, but it is highly, highly populated. Um, there is not a day that I've been out there where I will see a person. It's uh, maintained by the city of Dallas and the Audubon Dallas chapter. So it's volunteer run. Um, they are closed on Mondays and they do allow dogs. Um, so just something to keep in mind if you go out here, if you have been out there, it does get really, really busy. Parking can be a challenge, but it is a beautiful area. Um, it's fun. I'm out there quite a bit because um, it's just nice to get out and um, get some hiking in, some quick hiking in. Next slide, please. And then Cedar Hill State Park. So Cedar Hill State Park is right next door to us. Um, and so they are a very large state park. Um, so you don't have to go camping to enjoy this park. You can go fishing, you can go hiking, um, you can go biking. The Dorba Trail um, is over there. They have a couple different um, trails that you can utilize. Um, they are, like I mentioned earlier, this is when you need to make a reservation now because of COVID. Um, and you do need to pay for that reservation. It's about $7 entry fee. Kids 13 and under are free, but they have some beautiful trails. Um, I am over there a lot. I have a state park pass, so I do utilize that quite a bit. But it is a very, very beautiful area to go. It's well worth the visit if you're looking to do some hiking. Next slide, please. All right, so some ways to get involved. If you wanna continue um, to learn more about the different things that we're doing, we encourage you to come out and volunteer with us, um, you know, to help us maintain the spaces that we have, or maybe becoming a member. Um, if you're looking to build your skills. So this is something when I started, um, you know, wanting to do more outdoor things like hiking, camping, kayaking, all those things. Um, I started to get involved with REI and REI um, offers classes and many of them for free where you can learn like, hey, how do I pack a pack? How do I learn how to navigate with a compass? Um, and there are local outdoor groups. I suggest using Meetup as a platform. Meetup has um, many different groups that meet. And I, I saw someone put in the chat, they, they were looking for running groups. Um, I saw a really cool uh, running group on meetup um, that was really looked really fun. Um, so there's a lot of different avenues if you're looking to build those skills or if you're like, hey, I want to hang out with people who do all these things. And our websites are also down um, there if you want some more information about our websites as well. Yeah, and that's where you can um, get more information on how to become a volunteer. We have a volunteer portal where you would you know, submit your application of interest and also some information on how to become a member, all the different membership perks and what it's like to be a part of our team. Awesome. So I guess we'll stop sharing. And if there's any questions, then, you know, we could uh, have some answers for them. All right. Thank you guys so much. That was amazing to learn about all of the diversity we have in our area. 
I did see that there were a couple questions in the chat, but I think if we could answer those out loud, that'd be fantastic, was about uh, trail running. Uh, is it something that can be done at your centers? Is it popular? And are there any trail running clubs or teams that use your centers? So um, I don't know of any teams that specifically use our center. Um, and we don't have any like formed here at Dogwood. Um, I do know of, uh, there is a, I put in the chat, there is a running group here in Cedar Hill. It's called Cedar Hill Running Group. And I know they do meet and they'll run in town. And sometimes they do run at Cedar Ridge Preserve. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, um, if you go to meetup.com, there are some groups that do specifically do that. Um, um, there was one the other day I got a chuckle at, it was a group called, um, fat runners, fat and slow runners group, um, which I just laughed so hard. Cause I was like, that's awesome. <laughs> Go, you guys. Um, so there's some really cool groups out there. I, I guarantee you could probably find a group for trail runners, um, or even looking at REI might have groups like that. So you could probably find something that does that. Yeah. And you know, you got... I was gonna say, Marcus, uh, do you know of any trail groups or trail runs here at track? No, not tra uh, not running groups, but uh, here at Trinity River Audubon Center, our trails are relatively flat for the most part. So they, they would be ideal uh, if you were interested coming out to run. Sure, yeah, come on out. I've seen joggers, I've seen runners, and then also groups of people running on the nearby AT&T and the Trinity Trail. Too. So you have both options right there. All right, fantastic. Sounds like that we need, just need to start ourselves a, uh, a uh, wildlife runners club or something like that. Yeah. So, and, and we can have the advanced group and, you know, just maybe the group I'm in. <laughs> the not so advanced group. Exactly. Yeah, we're going to, yeah, we're going to say we're, we're looking at the wildlife. We're not slow. We're just looking at the wildlife. I'll be enjoying the, the flowers. And turtle stuff. running group right there. The turtles. Yes, we can have yeah. the turtles and the foxes maybe, or the <laughs> turtles and the hares. You're right, yes. the turtles and the hares. Okay, so speaking of, of maybe hares or something like that, you guys mentioned a little bit about invasive species. Uh, what are some of the ones that are challenging you right now, whether they're you know, mammals or plants? Well, I, uh, at, at the Tree River Audubon Center, and I think maybe, you know, I mean, if you're in Texas, you're no stranger to it, is the Johnson grass. Um, that's what we're actively combating and removing, and you have to do it again because it comes back. The rhizomes are so um, well adapted to reproduce, and um, the seeds will stay dormant in the soil for a very long time. And, you know, if you're not familiar with what it looks like, I'm positive you've seen it if you've driven through the house before. It's on the sides of the road, it's in the medians, it's in people's yards. And without you know, active control of it, it can create a monoculture, that's the only thing you have. So we've volunteers and staff members that are removing it and replacing it with, with native grass for prairies. And then um, other uh, invasive grasses too, like the King Branch Blue Stem, we have that here and there on the uh, sides of the road. Um, I can't think of any you know, fauna minus feral hog. And you can throw that in that category of invasive. We have those there. We're no stranger. Yeah. No what about, good. yeah. Our biggest challenge right now would be um, privet and nandina um, for plants. And um, privet, I did a walk at another location in Oak Cliff and um, they're a volunteer. And that is one of the biggest challenges they have. Um, because you have to physically go in, not just cut it, but then you have to treat it with a chemical um, because it just grows back and it just takes over everything. And I see it a lot. Yes, hedge parsley, I see in the comments, hedge parsley is an, another issue. Same. So we do battle um, quite a few different plant species. And it's, it's just difficult because we're, we have volunteers and then we have a limited staff and trying to keep up with it. And then we do have invasives, like, you know, you have fire ants and a couple others that you're trying to battle, but the plants are really um, persistent out here. So far we've done pretty good um, with some of ours, but you know, you'll go to other places and you just can't shut off your, your naturalist filter when you see. And um, once, 
something gets established, it's really hard to get it out there, get it out of there and everything. So you mentioned privet and andina, and those can be common in uh, like residential landscapes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can buy them at nurseries and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. what, what problems are they giving you out there uh, uh, at the Audubon Center? If they're okay for our, our, our landscapes, uh, you know, what, what, what issue do they, they provide out, at, out where you're at? They, well, they outcompete pretty quickly in uh, the amount of, you know, birds that love the berries. So both Chinese privet and Japanese privet, both the ligustrums, the birds will eat the berries. We love birds, but then the birds bring more privets and, you know, whatever's in your neighbor's yard is gonna end up over here in your yard. Um, and it's just real, real hard to handle, real, and you need an herbicide to make sure it gets cut back down because you can't just cut it and think that it's going to disappear. It's pretty aggressive. Yeah, in Nandina, the berries are toxic to wildlife, um, so that is something that is a challenge. You don't want um, them to be eating something like that and then having that toxicity and everything. It's hard because it looks beautiful. Um, so, I mean, we ideally try to promote in our bird friendly communities, part of our strategic priority, trying to promote um, native plants because native plants um, actually host more native uh, food species, larval species for birds compared to non-native and invasive species. So that's a big part of what we try to do. But as Jake mentioned, it's harder to remove um, those invasive species because they're not adapted to this area. They're not adapted to natural predators that are in this area. Birds aren't gonna know they're invasive or not, like they're gonna eat their food and everything. So, yeah. That's a good point. Yeah, that's a really good point. My uh, mother-in-law wanted to put some Nandinas in her, she's getting, she wants to get a new landscape and she had me look over the plants and it had Nandina in it. And I kind of, uh, I wrote on there, you know, ask about other, you know, uh, you know, other plants. And, and I say, and check the berries because I had heard about the berries not being healthy for our wildlife. All right. So we are getting close to time, but I wanted to ask everybody. So I know, so obviously the Trinity River Audubon is part or, you know, right at the Trinity River. So um, is there a, some sort of lake or river over at Dogwood that people can enjoy? Because people love being near the water, right? We love seeing the water, hearing the water, and, and that kind of stuff. So is there a water, some place uh, that you can visit at Dogwood Canyon? And also uh, what, what's, you know, are there any issues with having the, with you, with the water there? Yes, yeah, so um, we actually have what's called an ephemeral uh, stream bed. Um, and so on property, that stream will flow just based off of the amount of water we have. So right now it's dry. Um, if we get a good rainfall, it will flow. Um, it just depends on the season. Um, you will see, we are right next to Joe Pool Lake. We don't have access to Joe Pool Lake from our center. You have to enter in through the state park to get access to Joe Pool Lake from our side. Um, so we do get a lot, of, a lot of confusion. People think we're the state park and we're not. Just wanna clarify that. <laughs> All right. And uh, so uh, Marcus and Jake, since you're over there uh, at the Trinity River, um, I know you were talking about beavers earlier and stuff like that, but what's something special uh, that we might be able to see at track because of the river? Mm -hmm. well, you can go ahead, you go first, Marcus. No, that's a great question. Uh, I was just gonna mention um, the, uh, the, uh, the belted kingfishers um, that we get to see here which I, one of my favorite birds, I, I really like how they have those cool mohawks um, that you get to see and, and they have a really great call, can't miss them. Uh, and we get to see those uh, because we're so close to that, that water source. What about you, Jake? Other than the birds, um, if you are lucky, you might see a American River Otter. We've had photographers snap pictures from a river overlook of otters going up and down the river. So. You know, you wouldn't believe it if you didn't know, but there are otters in the Trinity River. And um, that's why it's important to keep that river clean and beautiful and the riparian habitats on the side, uh, not just for us, because it feeds our reservoirs, and, but also for wildlife, all the other mammals that depend on it. Too. So that, seeing a river otter, that's pretty exciting. I am jealous because I have never seen one out in the wild. So I'm going to be, I'm going to be there. I'm going to be looking yep. for those otters. Absolutely. Stay there all day. Maybe you'll come by. 
<laughs> That's right. I just, I got to get my pack, my pack with my hydration and my snacks and set up my little otter spotting station, right? Yeah. That's right. All right. So uh, I want to thank all three of you so much for spending your time with us. And if you have any closing statements, or maybe you want to remind everybody of your hours and your websites and things like that, and then we'll close out. Yeah. Everyone for, uh, for joining us and thank you for having us. Um, I think dog wouldn't track both Fridays and Saturdays, eight to one, right? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, register on our website, um, check out our Facebook and uh, see what else we're up to. Hopefully we'll get to see you guys soon. Absolutely. And especially with the holidays, you might, if you have, you know, you want to get out a little bit or maybe you have, uh, you know, a family unit that needs a little something to do. Uh, going to these places is fantastic to do. And also, uh, so on behalf of the city of Dallas and the Dallas Public Library, I want to thank everybody for spending your hour with us. Don't forget to send an email to greendallas at dallascityhall.com for your free thank you gift. And we will see you next week, Thursdays at noon. And we will have eQuest that does equine therapy. And, they, and also they do rides through the Great Trinity Forest. And so join us for that. And thank you all very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. Uh, y'all have a good day.